My stories are attempts at reception, at listening to voices from another place, far away. They only come out at night, when the background din and gabble of our world have faded out. Then, faintly, I hear voices from another star. Terry Gilliam, and welcome to my drab little world. I've used PKD for years. It has brought brightness, sparkle, flair to my life and to my plates. It can do to you as well. One thing today I would like to share with you, though, is a secret. Despite manufacturer's warnings, I use PKD washing up liquid to unclog my brains. Why don't you? <laughs> Well, the police once told me that I was a crusader and that they had no use for crusaders. But unfortunately, they didn't tell me what I was crusading for. <laughs> I, I, I was afraid to ask what it was I was a crusader for. And they told me that if I did not get out of the county, I would be shot in the back or worse some night. Uh, it may have had something to do with my writing. It may have had something to do with my lifestyle or a combination of both, but I was too afraid of the police to ask what it was I was doing. Philip K. Dick is considered by many to be the single most significant science fiction author of recent times. For most of his life, Dick's 42 novels were filed away under cult author and rarely taken seriously. But since his death, the films Blade Runner and Total Recall have brought him mainstream attention. Dick's vision was formed by the changing landscape of California, a rural paradise that he saw bulldozed into urban submission. From a trash world ever more dependent on consumer disposables, Philip K. Dick created a fictional universe in which the line between human and machine becomes blurred. Your toaster might just have an opinion of its own. Your telephone might be plotting against you, and your video camera might be keeping an eye on you before filing its own report. Phil was one of the last people to actually write predictive science fiction in the sense that, that he saw a new world coming before it was there. He saw the consequences of a media-soaked world. Again, 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 in a, in a golden, golden land of opportunity, opportunity and adventure. He's one of the few writers who has the satisfaction of having got it right in a complicated way. The one book about the... Um, everybody's down in bunkers, and they're having a false war broadcast down to them, and actually there's no war going on at all, it's just a media event. Well, Everybody felt that way during, you know, like the Korean War and Vietnam. In some ways, it was just a media event. And people got excited about it and it was political. But, you know, you became a connoisseur of the footage. And Phil knew that. And his heroes in the book are the people who are perpetrating the fraud. He enjoys their cleverness. There's no culture in California, only trash. I do seem attracted to trash as if the clue, the clue lies there. One must work with trash, pit it against itself. If God manifested himself to us, he would do so in the form of a product advertised on TV. Hello, I'm Elvis Costello, and I want to tell you about this PKD collection. 
featuring such classics as Lies, Inc., The Man in the High Castle, Ubik. Who can forget the immortal, the man whose teeth were all exactly alike? And of course, do androids dream of electric sheep? Order now using this toll-free number. Not available in any store. What you would notice if you were Philip K. Dick is that there's nothing natural in the world anymore. Everything that I see is plastic and glass and gaudy colors and, and strangely made. The human beings begin to take on an odd look. Our clothes are the same sort of plastic oddness. And therefore, our eyeballs begin to take on a kind of a glassy look. The entire world begins to take on a kind of a fake, artificial, made quality. And the question then naturally jumps to your mind, well, who made it? Why is it so crummy? Why is it so degraded and falling apart? Life in California was a commercial for itself, endlessly replayed. Nothing changed. It just spread further and further in the form of neon ooze. How the land became plastic, he thought, remembering the fairy tale, how the sea became salt. The truck drove on past gas stations, tawdry cafes, and motels. Nothing is so alien, bleak, and unfriendly as the strip of gas stations, cut-rate gas stations, on the rim of your own city. I was his second wife. We were both very young. Um, I adored him. He was wonderful and funny and um, a very nice man. This is 1126 Francisco Street, where Philip and I lived from um, 19, what, 1950 to 1958. We both felt that his writing was the focus of our life for, what, seven, eight years. His work life was involved with um, salesmen uh, on a small scale and uh, repairmen and uh, small business owners. So of course that's what he wrote about when he, when he wrote. But usually the occupation is not the important thing. It's the, you know, the relationships with other people and the internal workings of the, I didn't think I'd ever say this, but of the soul. He wrote about people's souls. Um, not a word I use lightly. I'm not so sure my universes are such fine places. But I do hope the people in them are fine people. In the ruins of Earth's cities, this minor man is busily constructing imitation artifacts that say, Welcome to Miami, the pleasure center of the world. The positive little figure outlined against the universal rubble is not sized, and yet in some sense great. I like to take employers that I've had and make them rulers of entire galaxies. He wrote mostly at night, like any sane human being, according to me. Um, you know, he wrote for long hours um, and a lot and pretty much all the time. The uh, position which writers such as myself hold in America are those positions are very lowly. Uh, science fiction is considered to be something for adolescents, for just um, high school kids, and for disturbed people in general to read in America. But then I discovered that in Europe, especially in France, science fiction was taken seriously 
and the science fiction writer was not regarded as something on the level of a janitor. At one time, there were 35 stories being circulated, and uh, one day we went out on the front porch here. The mailbox is much too small. We looked out, and 17 manuscripts were scattered over the entire front porch, all having been rejected the same day. I find it very hard to understand why it is that the name of Philip K. Dick is not more greatly respected, venerated, uh, why he's not put on a par with such dystopianists as, um, well, Aldous Huxley, let's say, uh, possibly even Jonathan Swift, Pirandello, certainly. He built up his reputation in countries that um, weren't so optimistic as the United States was in the 50s and 60s, let's say, pre-Vietnam, let's say, when uh, uh, to be optimistic was to be patriotic, which was to be good for business, etc. He was up against uh, the greats of the time, and people like Isaac Asimov and Robert A. Heinlein who, of course, were by and large optimistic. Uh, they saw a great future for technology, this above all. Dick didn't see any future about that. He, his idea of technology was little mechanical things scuttling in the gutter. And it's interesting that now, when uh, both Heinlein and Dick have been dead for a, a decade, Isaac Asimov is dead, it's Heinlein and Asimov who seem like dinosaurs, and Philip K. Dick who seems immensely contemporary. When I think of these stories of mine, I think of the Lucky Dog Pet Store. There's a good reason for this. It has to do with the lives of most freelance writers. It's called poverty. I've been reading science fiction all my life, and it's kind of weird how I just started working here without even knowing about this. When Philip K. Dick was first starting out when he was poor, he would come here occasionally and buy horse meat because he couldn't afford regular food. And he would come in here and buy his horse meat, take it home and fix it. And that's why he called himself Horse Lover Fat in his book, Valis. About every, about three or four times a month, a customer would just come in and tell me the whole story, so I kind of had it memorized. I read it in a few articles in various magazines. It's kind of like folklore around these parts. Oh, yes, he was a great self-mythologizer. I, you know, um, if he ate dog food, it's because he enjoyed it. Uh... And, and I can see him doing it. He's, you know, in, in, in a passion of self-pity, he would open the can, he would look at it, he would dip the spoon in, and then he'd think, oh, poor Phil Dick, to think that this great writer is reduced to eating dog food, and then, and only then, would he taste it. If you could see from inside a dead person, you could still see. But you couldn't operate the eye muscles, so you couldn't focus. You couldn't turn your head or your eyeballs. All you could do was wait until some object passed by. You'd be frozen, just waiting and waiting. The riddle-like quality of a dick novel is, I think, very, uh, very attractive. Uh, for, for one thing, he can... Oh, it's so difficult to describe a dick novel. They are actually beyond description. You don't quite know where you are. Uh, and at any moment, uh, strange, malevolent, malevolent creatures will appear who may be actual or may be part of an alternative world to which the other characters do not know they have access. Personality. Time to get those pills. 
As he glided by the small, out-of-the-way cemetery in his airborne prowl car, Officer Tinbane heard unfortunate and familiar sounds. A voice. The voice said, muffled and faint, I want to get out. Can anybody hear me? The voice came from beneath the grass. His baby sister, literally baby sister, Jane, uh, died at the age of six weeks. It's rife in his books. It's always there in the stronger novels, this sense of loss of his other half. And, and it's a very powerful theme. He longed for Jane throughout his entire life. It wasn't unique to Philip K. Dick, but it is perhaps unique in literature that that theme was explored so deeply and darkly and with such passion and sense of loss. Someday the girl would die and they would open up her body perform an autopsy and find a little wrinkled male figure, her brother, still no larger than a baby rabbit. His mother, not only by temperament, but by the child-raising manuals of the time, had imbibed the doctrine that it was bad to hold or cuddle your child too often. He hated his mother for what he felt as the poor treatment she had given his baby sister and felt that she was responsible for her death. He was left with the sense of who was this sister and I want her back. Describe in single words only the good things that come into your mind about your mother. Your mother? It's a test designed to provoke an emotional response. Shall we continue? Describe in single words only the good things that come into your mind about your mother. Your mother? Yeah. Let me tell you about my mother. In some ways, he was more pathologic than almost any patient I had met, as far as having glaring problems on one level. On another reality, he just didn't fit at all. When Phil and I commenced, I guess, round two of our therapeutic relationship in late 81, we both felt the need to look at foundations, to do some foundational work. Uh, normally, that's something a therapist does in one session with somebody in an hour puts down a database, looks at their whole life. For Phil, it took three sessions, and I think they were probably two hours each one, looking at it, just taking notes, asking pointed questions. And I've got here written, terrified of vomiting. Vomiting equals death. And this is now age four to five. He says he saw a psychiatrist, and he was told he was hysterical and afraid of dirt. He couldn't eat in public, and he refused to swallow. He said the next few years of his life, ages 8, 9, into 10, were pretty much okay. Went on to Berkeley High School, where he you notes know, problems in geometry uh, and worried that he was having sweats, palpitations, and shortness of breath. Uh, almost sounding like panic attacks, perhaps. Started to write science fiction at this point. He said it was to disassociate, and those were his words, which would mean to escape. Who's Bill? The doctor asked the little girl. My brother, said Edie, with the total poise of a seven-year-old. Where is Bill? With me, like he always is. I want you to show me exactly where he is. The child pointed to her left side, low down, near her appendix. He's my twin brother. How else could he be inside me? I tell him what's going on so he doesn't miss out. I'm glad I have a brother. He keeps me from being lonely. He has this notion of the afterlife in many of his novels. You could say that the afterlife was a, 
a kind of a uh, deep freeze, as if you'd been refrigerated and essentially had been stuck in a shelf in a mortuary, couldn't move, and yet you still had some slow-moving thoughts, and uh, communicating with the rest of the world basically by telephone. In the consultation lounge at the beloved Brethren Moratorium, several customers were communing with their half-lifer relations. Damn this earphone arrangement, Glenn Runciter grumbled as he fitted the plastic disc against the side of his head. In the earphone, words, slow and uncertain, formed. Fragments of the mysterious dream his wife now dwelt in. This is an unnatural place, he thought, halfway between the world and death. Phil's favorite theme was that things are seldom what they seem. Uh, I think that um, the line, just like a Phil Dick novel, uh, refers to a kind of feeling about the untrustworthiness of contemporary reality, that you could poke your finger through it in some way, and then you'd find out what was really going on behind it, except it would turn out to be another fake behind it, and you have to poke your way through that and so forth. I remember Phil saying, I, I want to break through what is only apparently real and get at what is really real. And that was his heroic idea of himself. I consider the universe to be a clever fake, with streets and houses and shops and cars and people standing in the center of a stage, surrounded by props, by furniture to sit on, kitchens to cook in, cars to drive, food to fix, and then behind the props, the flat painted scenery, painted houses set farther back, painted people, painted streets, everything not real, only a series of tapes being played for us. Once you've opened your mind to the notion of fake, you're ready to think yourself into another universe entirely. Technically, I was the third, but I think he married the first lady that he ever slept with, so I like to think of myself as the second. But I also think I was the most important one. He and Cleo lived in a little sort of a hovel in uh, Berkeley, and they were very poor, and they believed in being p very poor. They were sort of socialistically uh, inclined. And, uh, but then when he met me, he told me I, I and my house uh, were everything he always dreamed of. I'm very family oriented and um, very middle class bourgeois person, I guess. And so uh, I wanted him to write from nine to five. So he switched over and he wrote from nine to five and came home for lunch. Mars is a science fiction landscape of tremendous importance. And for Dick, it was the perfect kind of blank slate. For him, Mars was a perfect vision of American suburbia, an X-ray vision of Californian culture in all of its mindlessness and triviality. Everything had been stripped away, and the emptiness at the heart of things was revealed more than ever. Norm Shine walked down the length of garden between the rows of jagged leaves. Insecticides from Earth simply had not done the job here at Chicken Pox Prospects. The native pests had been waiting 10,000 years, biding their time, for someone to appear and make an attempt to raise crops. He was exhausted. Maybe each new colonist had started out this way, he thought, in an agony of effort. And then the torpor, the hopelessness, claimed them. Later on, he rented a little place that you could see dirt uh, between the uh, cracks of the floor to, to ride in. And he really liked that much better than staying around this house. He lived alone in this deteriorating apartment. Eventually, everything within the building would merge, would be faceless and identical. 
mere pudding-like kipple piled to the ceiling. When nobody's around, kipple reproduces itself. The entire universe is moving towards a final state of total, absolute kippleization. You could recognize this strange world with rubbish in the streets and, uh, well, rubbish filling up the houses, rubbish filling up your head. Uh, it all seemed to make a great deal of sense, as I think at first it didn't to the Americans. Um, why was all this? Well, Dick was very much against the consumer society. Goods meant nothing to him. Uh, this, I think, was a very admirable and non-conformist trait in his character. Of course, if he had any money, he'd spend it on drugs. Well, the 60s, the drug culture began, and Phil joined in enthusiastically. Um, partly he used it just to, uh, amphetamines to, to, he was producing a whole lot of work. He was under constraints to produce uh, two or three novels a year. So there would be nights when he would be writing all night long and he fueled it with drugs. His first big success was, was as the sort of poet laureate of the drug culture. Um, realistic novels about junkies are, are always, you know, depressing, morbid stories of lower class, scuzzy people. Phil wrote stories that, that a junkie could read and say, Hey, what's happening to my mind? I mean, it, it was the, the uh, prose equivalent of a drug trip. In Scanner Darkly, they're all taking this drug called death that uh, is burning out their brains, but since it's burning out your brain, you can't think straight about what's happening to you truly captures a poignance of people in our moment in history systematically slowly destroying themselves in the name of having fun and not being able to figure out what's happening to them and why everything's falling apart the way it is. They sleep like Count Dracula, he thought. Junkies do. Staring straight up until all of a sudden they sit up like a machine crank from position A to position B. It must be day, the junkie says. Or anyhow, the tape in his head says. Every junkie is a recording. It must be day. It must be day. There's a character in there that starts coming apart. And this is a character who is, um, an undercover narcotics officer who ends up investigating himself. And he finds himself looking at tapes of himself and discovering the man is guilty <laughs> of crimes that he didn't even know he had committed. He's dealing with his own sense of guilt and his own uh, inability to recognize himself. And it's, it's, it's schizophrenia at its best, and it's funny. There's two of me. There's the ashen, obsessive, endlessly working Calvinist. And then, there's the other part of me that doesn't give a f See, I'm two people. I'm on two sides of the fence. I just got more and more confused because it seemed as if he almost had uh, a different life for each wife that he married or each girlfriend even. And uh, he was so different in his uh, later life from uh, the way he was when he was married to me. He'd visit me every once in a while, and he'd be in rags, and he'd be with a teenage girl, you know, and they would, they would all be yellow and, and great big bags under their eyes. And, and I still somehow was holding on to the image of the, uh, this man who had been so charming and lovely and and delightful. I mean, the best husband you can imagine. I mean, better than the best you can imagine. Nancy enters the picture. She had just been discharged from a mental hospital. She was scared, brittle, 21, and also diagnosed schizophrenic. 
Uh, she was pregnant. He married her. He describes her as a screamer who wandered in the night. I think part of what was attractive to him was the idea that he would take care of her, that she really needed him. Uh, and of course, as I think so often happens in these situations, she ended up taking care of him just as much, uh, if not more so. And um, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which became the movie Blade Runner, uh, was written, I believe, in 1966, uh, pretty much just after they'd gotten married, although they'd been together for a little while. And I think that in some ways he wrote the book for her uh, because she cared so much about animals and, uh, you know, in Phil's thought, helpless living creatures and so forth, and that this kind of tenderness and human values, you know, deeply moved him and he wanted to get that across in a, in a book somehow. Rachel said sadly, Androids can't bear children. Is it a loss? I don't really know. I have no way to tell. How does it feel to have a child? How does it feel to be born, for that matter? We're not born. We don't grow up. Instead of dying from illness or old age, we wear out like ants. Well, I love, I mean, in Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, the idea, which is always, I thought, was central to what he's about, is what makes a human being. How do you define humanity or humanness? And, and it's that, that, and that's the battle that goes on in Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep between these androids who are almost exactly like a human being, and the only way you can tell is that they fail the empathy test, which is very hard to spot, and only experts can, but on every other level, they appear, they, they behave like human beings, but they're not. He sets all of this, in, in the case of androids um, dreaming of electric sheep, he sets it all in, in a world which is, is very uh, mundane, and his feet, despite the fact that his brain is floating in, in, in the heavens, his feet are firmly on the ground all the time, and he has a character who is killing these almost human beings to raise money to buy himself a real animal, because all he can afford at the moment, because the world has reached the stage where almost all the real animals are out of existence and only the rich can afford real animals, or the, um, the upper middle class can. And he owns electric sheep, which looks just like an electric sheep, I mean, looks like a real sheep, but he's terrified of being found out by his neighbors that he can only afford an electric sheep, and not a real sheep. Now that's a wonderful, wonderful situation. So his job is to kill almost human beings to get money, so he can buy eventually what becomes is an ostrich. He buys an ostrich, and then the great turnaround in that book is that the girl he falls in love with, who is not quite a human being, but he's in love with her despite that. When he reveals to her the truth of who she is, she's so outraged that she goes up and throws his ostrich off the roof of the building and kills it. Now that's that's wonderful. <laughs> that's all I can say. It's great. In exploring the theme of what is human, uh, Philip K. Dick could be bitter about what was not human. He did believe that human beings could be androids, mechanical creatures who uh, proceeded on the basis of cold duty, cold logic. There's a marvelous story called Human Is, in which an alien life form uh, takes over a human husband and is a much kinder and better husband to the wife than the original human being was. And at the end, the wife is just pleased that the alien has taken over her horrible husband. Uniquely in Philip K. Dick's literary existence, there was one question he posed in which he found a consistent answer that satisfied him. And that is, human means kindness. It means empathy. It means kindness and empathy extended to all life forms, regardless of their exterior aspect. I've always liked the scene at the end of uh, Now Wait for Last Year, when our hero, he's flying somewhere in an automated cab, and as he's flying along thinking, he says to the cab mechanism, if you were married, and, and the cab says, sir, I'm a automatic mechanism, we don't have wives. He says, okay, well, if you were me, 
and, and your wife had sustained horrible brain damage and was only going to get worse so that the rest of your life would be devoted to simply caring for her, would you stay with her or leave? And the cab said, I would stay with her. And he says, why? And he says, because not to stay with her would be to say, I need reality adapted specifically to me. Uh, I can't handle reality as it exists. And our hero says, you're right, I'll stay with her. And the cab says, God bless you, sir. I can see you're a good man. And that's the end of the book. Nancy left Phil in the summer of 1970. Then he didn't do any more writing, uh, particularly novel writing, for about two years, two and a half years, which is a very long time for him. Uh, what he was doing is he was uh, uh, taking more and more Benny's little speed pills uh, and hanging out with the kids, the young people uh, from around San Rafael and, you know, taking more and more speed. Phil himself was, was uh, you know, sleeping in strange cycles and, and probably becoming more and more paranoid. It depends a little on what you mean by paranoia. If you mean a psychotic conviction that you're being persecuted, which is not in accord with reality, I don't think I had that. But boy, I sure thought the cops were watching everything I did. And I was correct. I was tipped off by the criminal underground that my house was being watched and that eventually my house would be hit, my files would be opened, my papers would be taken, and so it came to pass. Uh, as I said in the Rolling Stone article on me, when I came home and found my house consisting of nothing but rubble, ruins, chaos, broken windows, smashed doorknobs, blown open files, I said, thank God I'm not crazy. <laughs> I have real enemies. It's a tremendous relief to discover that somebody really is after me. He'd written me this fascinating letter in 1972 about this terrible thing that had happened and, you know, how maybe it was the the local far right wing militia men who had broken into his house, but maybe it was the FBI or maybe it was the Black Panthers and so forth. Every time that Phil would describe a theory, would, would get into a particular possible explanation of what had happened to him, uh, that became the truth as he was telling it. And he, he could give you all the reasons why that was so, and you would be completely convinced that that's what must have happened. And then he'd say, well, but on the other hand, my attorney said it was the government. There was no doubt that it was the government. But what they were looking for, I don't know. What they thought I was doing, I don't know. I don't even know if it was the government. Maybe it was the thugs next door. Maybe it was the FBI. Or even maybe, most horrifying of all, he might have done it himself. Mental imbalance. Uh, he loved it. Uh, and he played with it. I mean, that's... That's the best thing to do with it. Um, if you're going to have, uh, if you've got a sort of paranoid side to you, best use it to write thrillers. Objects are sinister, he thought and sometimes seem to possess a will of their own. Suddenly, the towel wrapped itself around his wrist, yanking him against the wall. Rough cloth pressed over his nose and mouth. He fought wildly, pulling away. All at once, the towel let go. He fell to the floor in violent pain. He looked up at the towel rack. Three towels, all in a row. All exactly alike. All unmoving. Had he dreamed it? His belt got him around the waist and tried to crush him. I remember one time my fear of the police was so great that whenever I saw a, a parked police car and I was driving along, I would ask my wife to stop our car and I would surrender to the police on the spot <laughs> to whatever, whatever crime they wanted to accuse me of. And I merely took their advice. I left the United States and went to Canada for a while. Well, he had, uh, at this point, gone up to Canada to be guest of honor at some convention. And when the convention was over, he just chose to stay because he really had nothing to go home to at that point. His place had been blown up. 
various people had said they'd shoot him if they saw him again. Um, and so he simply sort of jumped ship and stayed in Canada and then got depressed, tried to kill himself, uh, checked into a heroin rehabilitation place, not because he was on heroin, but just because he wanted to be somewhere where they'd keep an eye on him. And eventually he moved down here and uh, I think I was expecting sort of a raggedy fugitive, mm -hmm. which in fact is how he looked at the airport. He was smiling and real cheerful, but his coat was too small for him now because he'd been doing all kinds of exercise at the heroin place, and his suitcase was tied shut with an extension wire, and he was carrying a Jehovah Witness Bible, he said, to mollify the customs people. And he was real desperate, real end-of-the-rope smile. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, this guy, uh, being a science fiction writer doesn't <laughs> look like such a prosperous job to me. Bill, do me. Imitate my voice. How can I? You're not dead yet. I wish I could come out, Edie. I wish I could be born like everyone else. Can't I be born later on? I was wrong, Bill. I thought the doctor could cut a little round hole, and that would do it. Don't feel bad. I'll keep telling you how things are. When we met, I was 18 and he was 42. When we got married, he had turned 43, but I wasn't 19 yet, almost. I didn't like to stay in a lot, but sometimes Phil couldn't go out. He suffered from agoraphobia, and it wasn't really well understood at the time. So he would tell people he had the flu all the time. But what it really meant was he couldn't leave the house. He was terrified. And if he forced himself to go out, let's say to go down one block and drop a letter in the mailbox, sometimes he couldn't make it all the way down to the mailbox and he'd have to run back home. And at one point it got so bad that for three months he couldn't leave the bedroom. He was really bad off. And then he'd go through short periods when he simply stayed in bed all the time and nothing much happened except maybe a few visions. When he started hearing a female voice talking to him in his dreams, he assumed it was somehow connected with the loss of his sister. My search kept me at home. I sat before the TV set in my living room. I sat, I waited, I watched, I kept myself awake. This is Faye Weldon, and this is God, apparently, at the bottom of a spray can. The spray can is marked PKD, Philip K. Dick. It's quite safe if you use as directed. The only problem is, there's no one anymore to direct us. I am on one of the most important quests a human being can undertake. It is nothing less than an updating of the concept of divinity. I'm looking for clues to an invisible being of great size, whose outline is dim, but to me, real. It hides itself and has the ability to delude. There's no reason to suppose that it mimics humans, but rather inanimate objects. Phil was worried about spiritual matters. He was worried because I wasn't baptized. So I went to a Baptist church and got dunked that Sunday. But that still left our son. 
Christopher's favorite meal for lunch was a hot dog and Ovaltine. Phil put the hot dog aside because meat wouldn't be appropriate for a baptism. Dipped his finger in the Ovaltine and drew a cross on Chris's forehead with it. And then he gave him a bite of the hot dog bun and a drink of the Ovaltine. So it was, Chris then had his baptism and first communion and that kind of made him a member of the church and safe from demons. What happened to Philip K. Dick in February and March 1974 defies easy submission, but the sum total was that Philip K. Dick felt he had been perhaps contacted by something higher, something that could make reality cohere for him. V-A-L-I-S means Vast Active Living Intelligence System, and uh, that was his name, or one of his names, for that which he felt had contacted him. It led him to produce a very, very brilliant novel, Vallis. You can see it as an account of what spiritual chaos is in our day and age. Horse lover Fat told us that God had fired a beam of pink light at him. Horse lover Fat was actually in search of the dead girl Gloria, for whose death he considered himself responsible. He had totally blended his religious life and goals with his emotional life and goals. For him, savior stood for lost friend. Horse Lover Fat is a name that derives from uh, Philip K. Dick's analysis of his own name. Philip, apparently from the Greek, lover of horses, and Dick, the German word for fat. You can find in Vallis that the dialogues between Horse Lover Fat and Phil the two aspects of himself are a brilliant self-examination and a kind of satiric uh, spoof of his own beliefs. I love the bravery of Vallis, uh, of, the, of the way he's willing to make fun of himself. Some of the things are from Phil's life, uh, and some of the things are from Phil's... the lies that he presents as his life. Um, and he has a set of those, and he's very careful to obscure the difference. I, I mean, he wants, he wants to make this a riddle. I mean, it was as though he were writing, you know, sort of private novels for himself, and and so it, it's um, for connoisseurs of, of. Well, the word con artist has artist in it. And he was an artist at that sort of thing, and he knew it, and he expected his audience to appreciate his performances. Dick's whole life was involved with religion, and his books really um, have a lot of religion in them, uh, often in rather comedic form. There may be a guy up there in a satellite who's controlling your brain. He talks about... God in a spray can. This is a kind of metaphor for, well, I suppose that as God I believe to be a human invention, so was the aerosol spray. And Dick saw these things as somehow interchangeable. For Dick, everything, of course, was interchangeable. In the end, of course, well, you have to face the fact, like many a good man, uh, Philip K. Dick went round the bend. That's the honest truth. Uh, and there are those who prefer the round the bend Dick to the, the marvellously sane Dick who saw the bend coming, perhaps, and wrote about that. That's much more interesting. So religion got him in the end, and so did all those drugs. Well, I think he was a different person to different people in a, in a fairly good way, in that uh, he had some kind of talent um, to make a 
acquaintances almost immediately think they were fast friends, which is, uh, you know, there are crowds of torn up people at his funeral who you uh, understood he'd just really remotely known supermarket checkers and bank tellers and stuff like that. But somehow everybody had the impression that they were among his closest friends. And um, it sounds a little odd, I suppose, but um, it generally made people feel real good about themselves. The so-called Philip Dick um, cult of the 80s began with Blade Runner, and I don't think that it would have begun, or maybe it would have taken 30 extra years had it not been for Blade Runner. Um, the, the movie tie-in edition of the book was and remains far and away the most successful publication with which he was ever involved. And it simply uh, reached this mass market that he had never before uh, been able to reach. A new life awaits you in the off-world colony. The chance to begin again in a golden land of opportunity and adventure. They don't advertise for killers in a newspaper. That was my profession. Ex-cop. Ex Blade Runner. Ex Killer. I didn't think he was being fair because he had only seen a few clips, but the impression that he got from them was twofold. He felt that visually and atmospherically they had captured the inside of his brain in an uncanny way, that he had, he had had this mental vision of what the scenery would look like, and there it was brought to life. And he found it quite astonishing and almost disturbing. Uh, but from what he was able to pick up of the, the dialogue and the um, basic approach to the Deckard character, he felt uncomfortable with it and felt that it had been Hollywoodized. And it was actually rather bitter about that. Philip K. Dick wrote with a hunger to understand what reality was, what it ultimately all meant. And that is a very unfamiliar hunger in this century, where metaphysical questions tend to be treated, per se, as insane questions. What Philip K. Dick did as a science fiction writer was to expand the bounds of the genre to include the most profound and brilliant metaphysical ideas that have ever been examined, I would say, in science fiction, and at the same time to retain what is great and marvelous about the genre itself, which is the excitement, the sense of alien invasion, uh, the sense of talking apparati that interact with human beings, the sense of, of daily confusing life in some imagined future that resembles our own. He merged the two, and he turned them in the novels, the like of which we've never seen before. Joe crossed the waiting room to the Padre booth. Seated inside, he put a dime into the slot and dialed at random. The marker came to rest at Zen. Tell me your torments, the Padre said. Joe said, I, I haven't worked for seven months, and now I've got a job that takes me out of the soul system entirely, and I'm afraid... The Padre's weightless voice floated reassuringly back to him. You have worked and not worked. Not working is the hardest work of all. That's what I get for dialing Zen, Joe said to himself. He switched to Puritan ethic. Without work, the Padre said in a more forceful voice, a man is nothing. He ceases to exist. Rapidly, Joe dialed Roman Catholic. God and God's love will accept you. You're safe in his arms. He will never... Joe dialed Allah. Kill your foe, the Padre said. Joe dialed Judaism. A bowl of fat worm soup, the Padre began soothingly, but then... I'm sorry, Mr. Fernwright, but your credit has expired. Please replace the receiver 